It's a huge pleasure to be here, a um, huge pleasure to be doing something after Linda, who I, whose writings I also write, so we've got new collaboration started going here. Um, but also, actually, I was a bit worried that what I was going to say wouldn't fit with what we've just been hearing, but, but in fact it does. Um, one of the things that Tina you know, didn't say is that one of the things that I actually work on is um, what you can probably hear from my title is management in the public sector, including performance management in the public sector, where for years the major problem has been that you very often don't have much in the way of tangible rewards to hand out. So when I heard you talking about the challenges of a low growth economy, which I think we clearly are in, and about the importance of, importance of context, I was, I was very relieved as well as interested because First of all, yeah, you sort of, um, you might actually sometimes like to talk to some public sector colleagues and um, probably make you feel better. It's still easier, I think, for you. Um, but also because I think context is hugely important. And what I'm going to talk about today is some of the context for the world of professionals in the sort of the, what's actually getting well into the first quarter of the 21st century, but where I will actually say I don't think anything dramatic is likely to change unless we have a world catastrophe over the next couple of decades. Because I do think that in thinking about your, the employees and the, the, your colleagues in the workforce, it is enormously helpful just to have a, a sense of the broader context of the, of the lives they live and of the way that modern careers are made. And, a lot of what I'm going to say is actually, at one level, quite familiar, but I think what interests people is the, the scale and speed of the change. And yes, indeed, the book, which, if you're interested in these, in these numbers, I, of course, urge you to read, it's about women, but it's also about men. It's about the modern professional classes, about the top 15% of the wage distribution, and about the dramatic way in which the lives of men and women in that part of society have converged and become very different from those of the, of the rest of the, of the world, at least in developed countries. So how do we actually spend our time? This is a, quite an important question, because if you're trying to think about how you motivate, how you reward people, Okay, some of the time they're in the workforce, at the moment we're in one of these moves of sort of feeling that actually we're not going to promote you by how many discarded pizza boxes there are showing that you were there all night. But actually, I'll try to do it on, on, on a more of an efficiency measure. But what are the lives like of the people that you're employing, the people that you want to motivate, the people that you're dealing with? And I think the most important thing to, to emphasize is that there is now a big tranche of society which thinks in terms of two careers. You don't just think in terms of, and I can remember my, 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 my great aunt talking about, oh, I've got a wee job. I don't go out to work too much, but now that the children have grown up, I, I get, I've got myself a wee job. That is not modern middle class life. Modern upper middle class life is two careers, thinking about two careers, thinking about balancing those. And that is actually where we are. A lot of focus goes on how many women there are on boards of, of you know, top companies. Um, but actually, if you look at what are classified by academics and sociologists and economists as kind of class one jobs, across the whole OECD, that's the whole sort of rich country's world, half of those jobs are held by women. And that has happened dramatically fast, and that 50% figure always astonishes people. But actually, if you, go back to, if you go back to your companies and you start counting, you will discover it's not equal in all departments, but that actually that, that is the truth of today's workforce. And among, it's particularly obvious among 20 and 30 year olds. And what is also striking is that time use, patterns of living, have converged for the men and women. Now, again, it's still the women who tend to take some time out for, for, for babies. It's still more likely that women will go part-time for a period. But among the professional groups that, that we deal with, these differences compared even to 20 years ago are actually tiny. People compared to women, educated women, graduate women in the 1960s or the 1970s or even the 1980s, graduate women today have very short breaks in their career. Now, they do quite often change jobs. And this, I think, since most of you come from quite large companies, you'll be quite aware of this, that one of your problems tends to be, how do we keep women in, in our companies? 
And this, I think, goes back to the question of, you know, what are, what are the tensions, what are the rewards that we can give people? How do we keep our best talent? But if you're thinking in terms of work patterns, career patterns, this is a world in which you have two career households. That's how they think about it. That's how they operate. And what is very interesting is that, and these, this will be, these will be available later when we actually want to look at them, right? Um, what is actually interesting, and this is where you'll see the, the academic, is that actually if you sort of divide the workforce up and you look at it in terms of gender, but you also look at it in terms of education, what you actually see is that labor force by education is increasingly the thing that matters. That highly educated women and highly educated <coughs> men follow very similar patterns. And among those who are childless, there are no gender differences in the work patterns that they have. So that's how we are. Modern professional workplaces made up of people from two career households and with ways of life that are increasingly similar. So what does this world feel like? And again, what implications does it have for a company, a professional partnership, a university that is trying to get the most out of its workforce, keep its best people, motivate those who are not trying very hard, all, all the usual things. All the usual things that make performance management the least impossible, actually. Um, so first of all, do we have less time? Are people right to feel time poor? If, you, if, like me, when you're absolutely shattered, you pick up kind of rubbish magazines, I think this might be a female thing, um, then they're always full of articles about being time poor, juggling, and all the rest of it. Now, one of the things that I think is actually quite interesting is that this is where there is a genuine issue here, which is different from professionals. If you go back sort of to science fiction of the early 20th century, there's all this idea that we wouldn't need to do any work at all. We're all going to be flying around and sort of on things. That not, not, we didn't have drones. We had little things that we all flew around up and down Fenchurch Street. But, but we also were going to be a leisure society. We were going to be a society in which people worked less and less. Now, the interesting thing is that across the world, total working hours for the population as a whole, and this is, this is increasingly true in developing countries as well, <coughs> have fallen. If you compare the average number of hours that people work today in 2016, the average number of hours that they worked in 1916, and we do actually know these things, by the way, this is not, this is where we actually have hard, wonderful hard data, the average has fallen. But for the professionals, total working hours have actually increased. Now, what is critical here is that it's actually about total working hours, because when you're thinking about the lives of people who you are dealing with, the thing that really matters is not just the number of hours that they're doing in paid labor, it's the number of working hours that they actually put in. And working hours are the sorts of things which you could pay somebody else to do, you might like to pay somebody else to do, but actually that wonderful personal robot isn't actually available. So the relevant thing is that across the world, the total number of hours that people work has fallen quite sharply. But among the graduates, among the professional classes, the total number of, of I don't want to call them grind hours, because many of them actually have lots of intrinsic satisfaction associated with them. But they are work hours, and they're things that have to be done. And what you're finding is that the total number of hours worked by men and women is equal. People don't ever believe this, but when you add them up, well, women don't ever believe it anyway, um, <laughs> but when you add them up, the total is extraordinarily even. And this, I think, comes back to something that Linda was talking about, fairness. Because I think the mechanism at work in, 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 in a household is that you know, if one of you is lolling around and one of you is not, you kind of notice. And there is a self-correction mechanism. <laughs> So it's not that everybody does the same number of hours in paid employment or does exactly the same number of hours unpacking the dishwasher because we know that everybody does more than their fair share of unpacking the dishwasher. This is one of the established facts. Everybody does more than their fair share of that. But if you actually get people to keep what are called time use diaries and you, you actually record what goes on, what you find is that in a household, the men and the women or the two partners do the same total number of hours over a long period. So this is actually quite interesting because, again, it's about the context in which you're actually operating in today's working world. It's a world of two career households. It's a world of households where actually, among the professional classes, 
everybody is putting in more hours per week than they than they were than their com their, their comparable families were, both the men and the women, 20 <coughs> years ago, and in which there is a broad equality. And what I've put up here is actually just just for those of you who are always sceptical, um, just a, a chart of what has been happening with, with total paid and unpaid work. Now, obviously, there's a bit of kind of wobbling around the, the, the 0.5. I mean, if you take different countries as well as I have there, so we've got. Um, but I have picked some, some, the sort of people that we usually, that we compare ourselves with and tend to feel will be worse than. And actually, what is interesting is that the UK, you know, taking the, the UK, Scandinavians, um, North America, and basically got pretty much the same pattern. So there's a slight wobble over time around that 0.5 mark, but actually it's as close to an even split as, as would be reasonable. The, the, only, the only Western country where it's not even, by the way, is Italy. Is anybody here from Italy? <coughs> okay. In Italy, the women are still so house proud that they still do more work. My wife is saying. Yeah, I mean, my, my Italian contemporaries, and even my children's Italian contemporaries, are much more house proud than me, but they live in hope that the next generation will be slobs like me and like me. <laughs> so it's only, it's only Italy that is different. So, a hundred years ago, the well paid were shorter hours than, that than everybody else, and today they work longer ones. So, again, the average working time, just, just to give you some sense of what this means, this is actually quite you know, it's, it's really quite dramatic. If you look at the average working time minutes per day of those with college education as compared to those who left school, up as I said, they left school after GCSE. They left school at 16 and not gone on into sixth form. And you take the, the sort of, you know, big national samples, you look at the average number of kind of hard minutes being put in, then, then that's what you find. And that's actually, when you add that up over a year, that's quite a lot of minutes. I mean, it, it really is. And, you know, again, no major differences for men and women. I mean, you know, statistically fairly insignificant, um, different from the two groups. But so the people that you are dealing with are putting in long days and long hours. And equally, which is the other thing, leisure time, you know, there are various things you could be doing, you could be sleeping. But if you actually take active measure time, then what you find is that changes, and here I put up the USA because they have more categories, but the, the English pattern is very similar, is that if you look at what has happened to changes in, in leisure time since you know, the last half century or so, what you find is that basically up at the top among the graduates, there just has not been any increase. Now, I actually think this is really quite important because it means that when people talk about stress and feeling time poor, they're, they're actually quite right. And subconsciously, they, they, they're quite right that, you know, some people are indeed having time to go and see the latest movies and shows and hang out with friends and, go, and, and others are, are much less able to. And this is actually a genuine difference. Now, the other thing which I think is really important, because this is actually part of where this this this, this this setting and context comes from, is that the importance of children. And one of the other things which is really, really interesting about today's modern, about actually today's society, but it's especially marked among the professional classes, is the increased focus on, on children when they have them. And of course, although Again, as you probably know, we have had a, we've had plummeting birth rates, and, um, of, you know, mostly most Western societies are failing to reproduce themselves, and the birth rates are lowest among the, among the graduate classes. Nonetheless, most people do have at least one child in their lifetime. You know, so a lot of what I talk about in the, in the book is about the, the differences and the decline in, in, in family size, and the fact that that's also related to education and careers and, and choices people make. But it is nonetheless true that most people will have a child, and when they have a child, both men and women will devote far more time to actually caring in a one-to-one -one way for that child than was the case in previous generations. Now again, I think we sort of all know this at some level because there's masses of stuff about it. I mean, I work in a university and people talk about helicopter parents. 
until we come across that term. Um, these these pets are always sort of hovering, ready to come shooting back, shooting down to make sure that everything is okay with their little darling. So they never go away, they hover. <laughs> um, but, but I think that what is interesting is that when you actually look at the hard numbers, again, it's quite <coughs> dramatic. And again, this is about the context in which you are actually managing and dealing with, with your colleagues and, and the people in your company. And, and I can't agree enough with him about the importance of context if you're doing performance management and thinking about time. I mean, context is so critical. So is fairness, which too quite <coughs> don't fit quite all that easily. I've said it's true, everybody. It is truest of graduates and professionals. And what I've put up there is the num minutes per day that are spent on direct childcare by women in dual earner cu couples. Now, most couples are dual earners. Days. Most couples are not dual career. The people you deal with are dual career. They're people where for both halves, their job is part of their identity. Most, there are very few couples in any Western country now where, it is again a bit of an exception, um, where you've still got the traditional pattern of, of, of the woman just staying at home. Huge proportion of couples, huge proportion of households have got two people working. But it's among graduate couples, and they all marry each other. They, they marry each other more than they ever did. Um, or live with each other more than they ever did. Um, they are the ones who, even more than everybody else, have increased the amount of time they give to looking after their children in a one-to-one -one way. Now, that's not hanging around behind your mother while she takes stuff to the dry cleaner. <laughs> that is actually one-to-one, -one, purposeful, loving, often ambitious interaction. And the amount of time that is being given to children by women who are also holding down jobs has been increasing dramatically, but it's been increasing particularly among those who are graduates and successful. And what is also interesting is that this is also true of the fathers. You know, again, it's not so dramatic. I have gone to the right thing, haven't I? Um, yeah, I merged the US and UK data for this one just to show you that this is not a peculiar thing about, about this country. For those of you who are running global firms, this change in fathers' <coughs> use of time is universal. <coughs> fathers are doing more, and again, it is much more dramatic among graduate fathers. It really is true that fathers <coughs> want to spend and spend more time with their children in a direct way than their, than their fathers, let alone their grandfathers, ever did. And this, I think, is, is, I mean, it's, of course, one reason why they don't have any time, but it's also a genuine shift in values, a genuine shift in context, and something which I think comes back again to this question of how do you hold people, how do you keep people, how do you motivate people, particularly in situations where sometimes you actually do need them to put in that extra time, to put in those extra hours. <coughs> and the trouble is that only too likely their partners in the same situation. And this, this kind of two-person juggling, um, if I'm going to introduce a personal note, I guess one reason I'm an academic is it's actually relatively easy to juggle your time as an academic because you can carry it around with you a lot more than, than, than in some cases. But, but um, it's, it's a real challenge. And, and trying to find work patterns and types of work and employers who actually allow you to respect your priorities and your partner to respect her or his priorities is, is I think, the, the, the big challenge for younger people today and it's one of the huge challenges that companies have to tackle. So just one other thing. Um, I do also want to end just with a, partly to wet your taste for some digging with more of these data because I think they're utterly fascinating. Um, but what, what is also interesting about today's working adults is the degree to which work, family, and leisure dominate their lives. And again, this is a, a slightly less good take on modern society. It's wonderful that we all love our children so much. It's wonderful that we are career-oriented, that we're managing to do this two and two. There has been a real loss for civic society and volunteering. And I do just want to sort of... Um, flag that perhaps partly just as a, as a way of, of rounding out the picture, sort of what has given. Well, what has given is a little bit sleep, a bit leisure, but what is also given in all honesty is for those people who are working, both the women and the men, 
this, this lack of civic engagement and volunteering, that compared to previous generations, at least in this country or in the US, what you're getting is very, very little volunteering. Actually, very little volunteering on average by anybody. But you can see that for full-time employees, which is increasingly important to everyone, um, it's gone. And the, the habit doesn't seem to come back in retirement, which I, I think is a slight, sorry to land or end on a slightly down note. But I think this is a profound change in the nature of our societies that goes with urbanization, goes with two career patterns, goes with our extreme child-centeredness. Um, but I suppose on a plus note, um, you probably don't have to worry about fitting all that volunteering into your employees' time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd like to stop there and take maybe a few questions. And as I said, I don't think I've got any, I certainly haven't got any sort of 10 top tips from you out of this, and I can only agree strongly with Linda that this is a, this is a really difficult <coughs> thing that you're, you are all having to do. Um, and certainly in my, my own organisation, University is truly awful. I get <laughs> you can only do better than us. But um, I do think that understanding the social context is really important. That when you're actually thinking about how you're dealing with people, you need to have some understanding not just of individual circumstances, but of the fact that very often what you are seeing is not an exception, but part of major social trends which are changing the environment even compared to 20 years ago, in which all of us, whether we're private sector, semi-public sector, small, large, medium, are operating. It's a very, very different world. Thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Professor Wolf. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? We've got time for about two questions. Some of the um, companies here have uh, senior managers who, who are not in the era that you're speaking of. So they have senior executives who still have a stay-at-home wife. And I think that their perception is still that that's how their juniors are. I mean, what do, do you notice that, that you sort of get these layers of, of what's happening? Yeah, absolutely you notice that and it is very difficult for people not to see their circumstances as normal. I think this is one of the most important things about human beings that you norm yourself on your experience and even when you know you're doing it it's very hard not to do it. And so you're right, I mean you will still have senior executives because basically the, the, the sort of the switch came with the generation that was being that was in university from about the late 70s, early 80s on. When you actually look at this historically, it's not that women weren't being educated in the 1950s and 1960s, but the typical pattern was that they worked often as, very often as teachers. When they had a child, they took seven or eight years out, and then, you know, again, for those who were, who were married to somebody who was very successful, you stayed at home. And of course, the interesting thing is among the very rich, that is still true. Because actually, if you are very rich, it's quite hard not to have one of you running the multiple households, the plane, the travel, and the rest of it. So one of the things that's actually quite interesting is you look at the very rich, and they're often, the, the, and they're here it is mostly men, but sometimes it's women. They're the ones who will have a stay-at-home spouse. Mostly a man with a stay-at-home female spouse, occasionally a woman with a stay-at-home male spouse. And often that spouse will in fact have been highly educated themselves and then will have stopped. And those people have more children too because they can also afford that. But Lydia, you're absolutely right. Um, people do still see it as normal and I think it is a, a, I don't have any, I don't have anything to suggest except um, possibly get them to think about if not their own children, their nieces and nephews and the lives that they're leading and try to get them to sort of see that this is what they're, that's the generation that their employees belong to. Because it's hard, I mean, if people think it's natural for there to be somebody who will come, it takes a long time. And, um, and sometimes it's just difficult, if I, if I go back to sort of the public sector, which is what I, I know better. For, for example, diplomatic foreign service, it's actually very hard, I mean, it's really hard. <coughs> and, they will say that you end up with a lot of imperfect postings simply because you've got to put two people 
rather than one with a trailing spouse. So I think it is an issue, I and mean, I think it will, it will go, um, but it is hard if people have an expectation of what is normal to get them to see that they can't just see the person who's making a fuss about it as an exception, abnormal, so, you know, stop, stop cosseting them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.